Welcome back everyone to the GGBL. We're in the month of July. We're getting real close to the GGBL draft that's upcoming tonight, 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Hope to see you guys there. We'll be a live stream. We'll cover the draft. We'll do all-star festivities. We'll do trade day talk, propose some trades for all of our 30 teams. So it should be a jam-packed live stream. Looking forward to it. Should be an exciting one, but we got gameplay up on the screen we got to talk about here. Seattle and Phoenix. Phoenix, of course, in the AL West, just trying to stay alive in their playoff hopes. And then Seattle, they're chasing San Diego, and they're trying to stave off Los Angeles. So they've got to try to win this series before the All-Star break hits. Try to get some more wins under their belt. Looks like they're firing on all cylinders here. Teeing off on Rico Ramos. He still does not have an out in this inning. Huge hit by Brent Miller. Going to get an RBI double after that Goro Kobayashi little looping single. Base hit here. Nope. Wait. Little bobble. <laughs> Thrown into the stands. Ay, 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 ay. That is going to get another run home. KAJ finding some luck for once. Ground ball. Hard hit. And an error from the second baseman. Dan McCullough comes up. They did get two outs. They finally got some outs here. But still with that runner on second base, Dan McCullough comes up and smacks a two-run shot. It is now four to nothing. The silver lining here for Rico Ramos Jr. Owners for the fantasy game. It's only two earned because we had two runs coming in off of the air. KAJ scored from the home run from McCullough, and KAJ drove in a run thanks to the error from the second baseman. So it's still two earned for Rico. However, Phoenix in the bottom of the fourth inning is coming back. Big double by Kevin Stoitz. Then we got Michael Ruth coming up. He's going to strike out. One-two pitcher to Hannibal Lobo. He's going to go down two. And Miguel Acevedo gets out of the fourth inning with no damage done against him. Let's jump here to the next reliever here for Seattle. That is Diego Marmalejo here in the bottom of the sixth inning. Two down and a big hit here by Kevin Stoitz. That's going to get the first run home for Phoenix. It is now 4-1. to one. Stoitz coming up big. He's now got two doubles in his last two at-bats. That's going to be number six on the season. Michael Ruth goes deep and a 1-2 pitch. That baby's gone. That's a two-run shot. And Phoenix, all of a sudden, is only trailing by one run. Seattle, got to get this thing on lockdown. You can't lose to Phoenix. They're just trying to keep their season alive. Thing was absolutely launched. 433-106 on the exit velo. We're going to jump ahead here to the bottom of the eighth. We got Hannibal Lobo coming up with two outs and a 1-2 pitch. They had one more strike to get out of the inning. And they're not going to be able to do it. Lobo lifts a little looping single right in between first and second. And he says, I'll take it. But that's going to step up Ray Carrasco, the second baseman, who had an error before earlier in the game. And their second baseman on the opposite side, Damian Campbell, throws it away. How the turntables. <laughs> Ray Velasco, the second baseman. Throwing the error in the very start of the game, Damian Campbell comes up with his own error, and that's going to drive in the game-tying run thanks to a walk. Oof. Seattle just blew this game. Very highly likely that they're going to blow the game. Giuseppe Young, bases juiced. 2-2 pitch to Chuck Storm, the rookie. He takes it looking. Oh, that is disappointing. That was a big moment for Phoenix. Is a bigger moment for the rookie catcher. Had to find a way to come through there. Just could not take the bat off his shoulders. Very tough pitch to take, by the way. But now you got to walk here for Phoenix. Seattle now with one man on, and it's going to be up to Damian Smooth. What a great name. 5-0-1 ERA. He's got to face off against Goro Kobayashi. Already got a hit today. But that's not going to matter. The batter in the box doesn't matter. They pick the runner off, and now we go to the bottom of the ninth. A chance to win the game on a walk-off, and Colton Cannon is going to swing on a miss there. That's Giuseppe Young again with another big pitch. Good out right there. Ground ball here. They're going to get Hinkle. He's going to ground out, and then McCallum's actually going to draw a walk. This is huge. This is big time for Phoenix. Now they got some traffic on the base pass here with their top hitter, their best hitter, Stoitz. Can't come through. Again, Giuseppe Young pitching well, pitching well in the clutch. So now Kobayashi gets another chance after getting his at-bat taken away from him. 
in the top of the ninth due to that pickoff. He laces that single back up the middle. Here is Brett Miller with a little bunt opportunity here to move the runner. They do. And, oh, they just got him. So Damian Smooth was Mr. Smooth right there. KJ, 2-2 pitch, and he's going to take it looking. Curveball. Nasty curveball. Lefty-lefty matchup. They got KAJ to half commit. Should have trusted his instincts there. Joshua Torre comes up. Line drive to center field. That's going to be caught. So we're going to go to the bottom of the 10th. We're officially deep into extra innings now, guys. Full count pitch, and Giuseppe Young is still out there. He's been clutched for the last couple of innings, but not here. He's going to allow Michael Root to walk. They're going to pull him for Darren Avalos. 1-1 one, one pitch. He's taken off. McCullough's got to throw him out, but not in time. Avalos is going to get a stolen base. Let's take a look at the jump here. 21 miles an hour. This dude was moving. My goodness. And the pop time didn't help at 1.82. Didn't help him. But that guy was moving. 21 miles an hour. That's, that's fast. 2-2 Two -two pitch here to Hannibal Lobo. And oh, they're taking off for third. Safe is the call. What is he thinking? Darren Avalos, you got a chance to be the hero. The, the game winning run right there. 3-2 pitch, and here we go. Anibal Lobo with the single back up the middle, and only 90 feet away it was Avalos. He scores easily, and Phoenix will walk it off. Seattle absolutely blew that game. Not trying to take anything away from Phoenix. They were knocking at the door quite often, quite frequently, whenever they got the bullpen going. They had Marmalejo coming in. They had Gorzelski coming in. So between those two guys... Phoenix was allowed to come back. Giuseppe Young was coming through in the clutch moments there. Shutting down that Phoenix push to come back. But, man, he just couldn't quite shut him down, at least for one more inning there in the bottom of the 10th. But you had that error from Damian Campbell. I think that that really changed the momentum. You can see Marmalejo gave up three earned. You had Giuseppe Young giving up one earned. So the story has been set that Phoenix had a bunch of opportunities. They couldn't cash in early, but they cashed in when it counted. They hung around. Sign of a good team. Sign of a team that's never going to quit on you. And they got the dub. Rico is actually pretty good. It's decent. Seven Ks, four innings, six hits given up, four runs, but only one earn. So I made a mistake. I said there were two earned. There was actually one earn. Pretty crazy to think about. So um, he, had a good he had a good performance for you guys that had him in fantasy. You take that. Take it. All right, let's head out to Minnesota. We've got Mark LaPierre, custom pitcher. He's 3-9. and nine. Not having a good year as far as the win-loss record, but his other numbers, his peripherals, pretty good. His averages, pretty good. ERA, whip, looking pretty solid. On the other side, we got Liam Snow. Rookie pitcher has not had a single GGBL start. So this is his first ever career start. Not his first ever appearance, but, you know, these are the milestones that you got to track for some of these guys. So he does get two quick outs here. Great play at second base to get that second out. Good athletic play. Next batter up is James Levitt. That is the first base hit of Liam Snow's career given up in his first start. Thanks to the veteran, James Levitt. Next batter up, David Gonzalez, custom player, going to pop up in foul ground. And we're going to jump over here to the top of the second. Mark LaPierre striking out Franny Hyacinthine. I think that's how you say the last name. I don't know. <laughs> Let's go bottom two. Another base hit. Leadoff base hit. Abram Grandstaff. That's going to be a single, believe it or not. I can't. This guy's an outfielder. Can't believe that he didn't make it to second there. Another base hit thanks to Lewis Patel. Got to get this thing back in to prevent that run, guys. Pittsburgh's defense able to do just that. Good relay throw back in. But Patel, it's 16th double of the year. Full count pitch here. Ground ball up the middle. Great play. Can they get the out? They do. Oof. But the run does score. Mason Maxwell with the hard contact up the middle, but great play at short to get the first out of the inning. Here is Milton. Fly ball to left. Camping underneath it. Got it. Makes the throw back in, but that run will score. It is now 2 to nothing in the bottom of the second inning. So Liam Snow... 
getting into a little bit of a troublesome start here. He's got to get some quick outs in the next couple of innings if he wants to last. So let's go bottom third. He's already got a man on base here. That is going to be another base hit. So again, a lot of full count counts. Full count situations here for Snow. Got a 1-2 pitch here. And a great play out there in right field by Karos. Makes an incredible play out there. Able to keep that runner at first base. But runner from second does move to third. We finally get a strikeout. Here by Liam Snow, his first of the ball game. Nice little change up right there to David Gonzalez. Our curveball, so a little circle change, I believe that was. So still 2 nothing game. Here's a ground ball to third. Makes a nice play over to second. So still two runs scored against Snow. Let's go top four. Let's see how Mark LaPierre is pitching here. He's going to strike out Ullman. And then he's going to get a ground ball from Chucky Morton, the catcher. Little bobble here, but no. What is up with these second basemen? These are easy outs. You gotta have them. Double clutch. Got Chuck Knobloch up in here. Knuckleball on Joey Singer, and he's gonna strike out too. So, you know what? Lop here is pretty good. It's pretty good. He's a nice little strikeout pitcher. That knuckleball. Very, very tough to hit. Let's go bottom forward. Liam Snow. Already got one out here, but Mason Maxwell comes through with a double. He got denied on a hard hit single back up the middle. If you guys remember, shortstop made an incredible dive to make him 0 for 1. He wasn't going to stand for that, it seems like. He got his extra base right there. And that's going to do it for Liam Snow's first ever GGBL start. Pretty pretty decent. I wouldn't say that it was spectacular, but it was pretty decent. This run will count against him here after a big double thanks to Gaylord Milton. It's now going to be 3 to nothing, so those earned runs are going to be charged to Liam Snow. Three earned in three and a third, officially, for Liam Snow. Not the greatest start ever, but I would anticipate that he's going to have some growing pains. He'll get used to the action here in the GGBL, and he'll become a good pitcher. He's got that A potential. I think he's got what it takes. But that run will go to Mata, the reliever. So it's not four to nothing. Minnesota, LaPierre is still slinging it, still out there. Another strikeout. He's got Franny on him again. 2-2 pitch here to Karos, and he's going to go down to another strikeout here in the top of the fifth. LaPierre just killing it, man. 2-2 pitch here to Rosales. Ground ball to third. That's going to be an easy play made for Minnesota, and they're out of the fifth inning. And why do I show you guys this? Because it's important. Take a look at the line score. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. Top six. One down. And Hardesty comes through. God. It's like every time I start looking at it, every time I start thinking about it, it's like the game has telepathy. Like it just knows, right? Just knows what you're thinking. We want a no-hitter. We want history in the GGBL. Can't happen. So Lapierre, after giving up the double, does walk the next batter. And they, they're still in some business here. They're still in some business. They can get a double play and get out of here. But that's going to do it for Lapierre. So it's kind of a crazy situation, right? He's tossing up a no-no. Gives up a double, gives up a walk, and then that's just it for him. He's got a four-run lead. So they are going to go to the bullpen here. They do get another out. Man on first and second, two down, 3-1 pitch. And Chucky Morton, the one of the better hitters for Pittsburgh, can't come through in the clutch. And he does fly out to right field. So now let's jump here to the top of the seventh as we got Pittsburgh is in some business to get a little comeback going, right? Man on first and second now after this base hit by Rosales. So they're back up on the board. However... Grandstaff comes through and puts this ball right down the line. That's going to score another run, maybe possibly two. Oh, interesting decision there. Uh, James, you're not that fast, okay? You're not that fast. So they do get another run here, 5-2. to two. Pittsburgh will tack on one more run, but that's not going to cut it. It's not going to do it. So the Jacks will get a W here, 5-2. to two. It was just kind of nice to see these two teams, especially just given the situation that we've never seen LaPierre and Liam Snow makes his GGBL debut, or not necessarily the, his debut, but his first ever start. It was a good situation to to show those two teams because we're probably not going to see them for the rest of the year because they're definitely not making the postseason, not making the playoffs. They're just not, not that good this year. So now we're going to kind of shift gears here because that's going to do it for gameplay action. The rest of the video is going to talk about the draft class, the players that are involved in it, positions, names, overall ratings, potentials, 
and then how it's gonna work. So what's the process gonna be like when we go live, here's how it's gonna work, that type of thing. So I do wanna get the community involved. I'm gonna explain that to you guys in the next couple of minutes here, but I do wanna explain what, what our draft class looks like in a way. I'm gonna do more of that once we actually get going live tonight, nine o'clock Eastern Standard Time. But I kinda wanted to use this extra time at the end of this video to talk to you guys about how it's all gonna work. That way there's no surprises. That's what, That way everybody's prepared, ready, excited for the draft live stream. So guys, let's talk about the draft class. And if you're not gonna watch that, then I'll just see you guys tonight in the live stream. So for the draft class this season, I am making the decision that we're not gonna do a prospect showcase. I think we'll do that for like season three or something. I just got the submissions for players a little bit late for season two. Back in September is when most of these submissions were coming in. So I got to get a little bit ahead of the game as far as that's concerned for uh, this type of thing to happen because we are moving faster through season two. I want to move faster through season three, season four, so on and so forth um, as we get into the winter in real life here. So for the draft this season, we're not going to do a prospect showcase. I'd, I would like to do one for season three, but I think moving forward, we got to get these submissions in a little bit faster, a little bit quicker. A lot of these submissions came in late September, which uh, between all the other content that I'm doing and then of course the GGBL it doesn't give me a lot of time to actually create the players and get them onto a showcase roster, if that makes sense. But just a reminder, through your channel support, whether that's through Patreon on my main channel for GG9, or YouTube channel memberships for GG9. The GGBL channel is not monetized, so I, I don't have an I don't have an ability to kind of offer that up for this specific channel. But if you go to my main channel, you can support me there and on Patreon as well. So if you do that, twenty dollars supporters get a seventy-five A potential player. Every single draft class, as long as you're a patron, you're still going to get that specific player. You're twenty-one years old and you follow that breakdown here uh, below. $20, $10, five, and three. Here's the rated player that you're gonna get, plus the potential. We had 14 responses come through for this draft class, and let's reveal some of those guys here. We got a couple first basemen by the looks of it, actually one first baseman, Yoma Kitkat from Taiwan. I don't know about the last name, but it is what it is. <laughs> I'd have to look it up. I don't know if that's a real last name or not, but we'll go with it. Marcus Trumblin, a catcher. Freddy Altoro, also another catcher here. Brady Urker, a center fielder. Dylan Joseph, a third baseman. Ragnar Lothbrok is a starting pitcher from Norway. That's an interesting one. Six foot six, so he's a big, big boy. Plus, you got another big boy pitcher here. Frank Giuliani, starting pitcher. Plus, he can play a little bit of second base. Um, so we'll have to kind of manage some of these two-way guys. I don't want to get too two-way happy uh, down the down the road. I think I'll honor it for you guys because you were, you were early patrons or early channel supporters for this series. But I think as we get into like year two, uh, actually year three, year four, five, we're gonna kind of slow down on those on those two-way players. It's just it gets a little crazy to manage, but. The guys that you see in orange, those are $20 patron or channel supporters. Those are 75 overall A potential guys. So you can see we have quite a bit of them. It's a very loaded draft class this season. So let's turn our attention now to the channel points side. We had 13 submissions, but this is actually um, down to eight. Eight submissions here. So the guys in orange are the players that are coming in for year number two. You see the channel point submissions here for your number one guys. You got Vince Scoff, Colin Ward, Brody Bush. You guys recognize these names by now. Um, so some pretty good players. We had one guy actually. Got to mark this up here. This is a 200 point channel submission. Everyone else is 300 channel point submissions. If you guys need a reminder of what channel points are, basically it's on my main channel where the form is located. And from there, you guys will answer questions based on the content, based on the videos themselves. How many yards is Jared Goff gonna throw for in my Lions franchise? How many touchdowns are we gonna have on the ground against the Seahawks or something? Um, 
who's going to win this matchup in the GGBL? How many strikeouts is this pitcher in the GGBL going to have in the next upload? Things like that. You literally answer the questions and you if you get it right, you earn channel points back. So it's a pretty easy thing to do and it's just another way for uh, my community to get players and get prospects in my series. Um, again, not everybody's got $20 just sitting around, you know? Not everybody's got $20 to, to donate to, to a YouTuber, and I get it, you know? Not everybody's got $3 to donate to a YouTuber. So I'm just offering different ways, different avenues for my community to uh, get players, to be invested in the series, so on and so forth. So I, I'm thankful for all you guys that are, that are donating um, on Patreon or through YouTube channel memberships, and I just want to make sure you guys feel the love back, you know? Um, most of you guys are just doing it because you're charitable and you're very generous, and of course, I appreciate that 100%. It keeps me going, keeps me alive with this content grind. <laughs> but, um, you know, I do want to pay it back as well. So, you guys, that's part of the perk that you are constantly getting the opportunity to get players in my series as long as you stay patrons or you stay supporters. But of course, with channel points, it's just a way for people that might not have money to, to donate or you know they don't, they're not comfortable with it. It's just a good way for a, a free way. You got to grind a little bit, a little bit more to earn 300 channel points, you know. But at least it's a free version. It's a free way to do it, and it's very easy, very simple to do. Now, if you are a patron and channel supporter, you can still participate in channel points. I'm not like locking you guys into different buckets per se. So it's still an opportunity for you to even get more players um, into this series because we need them. We need them. GGBL, all custom roster. Definitely need as many custom guys as we can get. Um, CPU players are just kind of there as filler. That's really what I what I look at those guys like. But real quick, we have one channel submit channel points submission guy gb wallace he's a 200 point 200 channel point player which makes him a 70 b and then everybody else in orange is going to be 75 a so you can tell that this draft class is going to be very very loaded with talent so it just goes to show that you guys love getting your players into this series and you guys want to be one of those guys that really helps their team push forward for a, a gold series championship. So I'm gonna actually have to do some digging here to see like positionally, where are we really strong at in this draft class? It looks like pitcher is getting a little bump. I love to see that. Catcher for sure. I've seen at least three catchers now that are coming in here. Um, we have Sean Murphy, <laughs> catcher. John Murphy, not not the real one, not the real one. But we got a couple short stops. GB Wallace can play center and catch, so he's kind of like a Chris Addison type. Love that. Corner player here, Hayden Carver, and Connor Sapers, starting pitcher, and Spencer Clark, starting pitcher. Interesting, interesting. All right, now let's turn our attention now to the Fantasy Challenge players, if you guys remember. Fantasy Challenge is yet another way for you guys to earn custom players in the GGBL. And of course, the fantasy side, that starts at the beginning of every single season. You will select your players from a group of players each by each position, catcher, first base, second base. You have a certain amount of money that you can spend. Each player has a different salary. The better the player, the more the salary. You gotta stay within your budget just like DraftKings or FanDuel lineup creation, if you've played that, daily fantasy games. And throughout the season, those guys' production throughout the season is going to earn you points. So it is a season-long game, and whoever finishes in the top 50% of the group, so let's say there's 20 players, you got to finish in the top 10 in order to win a prospect, in order to win a prize. Those guys will then get an automatic ticket to head into the playoffs, the Fantasy Challenge playoffs, which then you'll be able to select players that uh, that are in the playoffs, the GGBL playoffs. So there's a little playoff challenge as well. If you win that, 
then you get an international prospect, your choice, or you can go into, you know, you get another draft class prospect. So there's a ton of, ton of players to, to earn here. Um, let's just see what we got, right? So don't mind the ones in green. Those guys are already in the GGBL. These guys were one. Um, these guys were international prospects that signed in the off season. So Goro Kobayashi's on Seattle and Lavernia Sturridge is on Miami. So these two international guys are already on rosters, just kind of don't even think about them. This guy here, I believe Malcolm Hess, I gotta get him into the roster, but it's a little late now because we're already halfway through the season. So this guy was supposed to come through in the off season on season one, but I just did not get around to it. So Malcolm Hess, I'm, I apologize, I'm missing a year for you. But I will get you in, um, and I'll, I'll bump up your bump up your overall by a little bit too, so you you can enter into season three with a little bit more um, contribution for your team, whoever that you're going, whoever that you're going to. Um, anyway, so I think it's Michigan. Actually, it's going to be Michigan. There you go. So as an international prospect, you can choose which team that you want to join. So we have Seattle, Miami. And Michigan. So, a couple guys here that we're going to look at. We got Admiral Holyfield. Great name. He's a draft class prospect. Cesar Paniagua, another pitcher. Mark Kelly is another catcher. Zach Zumwalt, a right fielder. And Drake Coleman Jr., another first baseman. These draft class prospects, the ones that I'm highlighting here, are going to be 70 A potential players. 70 A potential. Not 75A, not like Patreon or channel points. These guys, these guys are going to be 70A. The grand prize winner is the generational prospect. It's an 80A. That would be this man right here, Noah Pinkard, a shortstop second baseman from the Virgin Islands. Hits switch, throws right. He's six foot two. Pretty nasty, nasty player, man. Nasty, nasty player. Noah Pinkard is a well-liked guy, but being the tallest in school makes him stand out, but can be lonely. <laughs> being lonely, being tall is being very, very lonely. Therefore, he got into baseball honing his skills in the shadows behind the pitcher and making the hitters not aware of his presence. Funny. So Noah Pinkard is your generational prospect. He's gonna be the, the ADA guy. He's gonna be the dude that everybody's gonna want to go get. All right, guys, so real quick, let's just go ahead and take a look at how the draft is going to work. So this was something that I thought about in the live stream, and I'm like, you know what? That makes a lot of sense. Let's let's do that instead of the way that we did it in season number one. So the, the Atlanta Sting, they have the number one overall draft pick. And I think just considering their roster, if we look over here at that second baseman, they've got Xander Pollock at 75B. Their shortstop 78C. I think that they will be they would be hard pressed to pass up on the generational prospect that 80A Noah Pinkard. He can play second, he can play short. I think he's gonna play shortstop for these guys when they draft him. So it just makes the most sense. Because what would end up happening here is the CPU would end up taking like a first baseman, right? And we have like maybe you know we saw a couple first basemen on the list i think uh, like a 70b first baseman so they would basically in real life if you applied the logic here if you applied the logic you've got mike trout sitting there or bryce harper you got bryce harper mike trout sitting there francisco lindor these guys sitting there and you know that they're highly touted players but you're gonna go ahead and take you know reese hoskins or something <laughs> or you're going to go ahead and take uh, Rick Porcello. You know what I it's Something like that, right? So I think when you're in a position like Atlanta is and you absolutely need that type of player, I think it's smart as me as the commissioner to go in and just make that selection for them. So how we're going to operate it here in the, the next few seasons, obviously like in year 8, year 9, year 10, maybe... It doesn't make sense for a team to go after 
the generational guy, the ADA. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, simply because, you know, if they've got, if they've ever got like a 90 overall player that's entrenched there at first base or second base, shortstop, you, you get what I mean. It doesn't make a lot of sense for them to go after that guy. So we'll have to play it. We'll have to play it out. Maybe it makes more sense to become or, or user the, the number two team or the number three team because they need they need a guy like that, right? But let's just go ahead and start the draft and just see how this is going to work. So it's going to work a little bit differently than last season simply because I'm making the selection as the number one team. Now, last year I went in as Richmond because I'm kind of managing Richmond. Um, that's kind of like how I get involved in the series a little bit because I, I really don't. It's just a lot of uh, editing and a lot of managing 30 team, 30 other team, 29 other teams. <laughs> so this is kind of my way of having little extra fun added in. Um, but I, I, I don't, I kind of, now I just don't want to make the picks for Richmond. I, I, I want to make sure that the league is doing the right things, like very logical things, right? So let's go in and take a look at the draft class here. So we've got a couple pitchers, reliever, starter, closer, closer, first baseman. So technically I could draft Alexis Ramirez and Ryan Smith because they're positional players. I could, you know, draft those dudes and, and have it make sense for the integrity of the draft class. Um, but for me, I'm gonna focus on like the positional group. So we need to find the second baseman. We have uh, number 10 here, Randy Ciccioni, or Ciccone, and shortstops. 29th, 59th, 67th. So I think it makes most the most sense to go after this dude, Randy Ciccone. So we're gonna draft him, and that is gonna be the generational prospect, Noah Pinkard. So we're gonna replace Randy Ciccone with Noah Pinkard, and you know probably get his overall upgraded. I don't. He's. It says he's 67 to 98. I don't think he's an 80 overall player. <laughs> or potential actually that's his potential i don't think that he's an a potential player but we'll see we could be surprised either way he's becoming noah pinkard either way now again i kind of mentioned this even though i have 30 teams all user controlled i can't make the picks for vancouver i can't make the picks for pittsburgh so whoever this is going to be and it looks like it's going to be the catcher juan navar 37th rated and if we go back and we take a look at our draft class screen, we have Mark Kelly, who is a Fantasy Challenge winner submission. He's a 70A. So he's not a 75A, he's a 70A. But he can, he can catch, he is a primary catcher. So he would be up for replacing this Juan Navar. Now let's go back and look at our channel points, guys. And we have this dude here, Sean Smudge Murphy. He's a 75A. He can catch. He's going to be up on the board to replace Juan Navar. And then we got our channel supporters, which we have a bunch of 75As, plus two catchers, Marcus Trumblin and Freddie Altoro. So the good thing about the prospect showcase game is that you were able to kind of see who these guys are and did they perform well enough in order to be that guy, to be the number two player. They're, they're the same rating, 75 A's, but they got a little different size. They got a diff little different archetype here. Contact fielding for Trumblin, power fielding for Al Toro. So they, do, they, they go about their game a little bit differently, right? So it sucks that I wouldn't that I wasn't able to get a prospect showcase to you guys, but you know this is a lot of work. Like 28 players here that I'd have to create for the game, uh, make sure that they get enough action into the game. So I, I think it was just best to kind of forego this for year two. But anyway, you kind of get the idea here um, as as we go back to Juan Navar. So for Juan Navar, we're going to community vote and we're going to see who you want to replace Juan Navarre. Did we want Trumblin? Did we want Al Toro? Did we want Sean Murphy? Did we want Mark Kelly? So we had four options to choose from. Obviously, there can only be one. 
And then we move on to the next player, which will be, I think, probably the left fielder. Maybe the first baseman. Let's see. Ryan Smith, left fielder. It's 100% scouted for Atlanta. His potential is 81 to 93. Overall, a little bit on the low side. That, but that's okay. None of that really matters because we already know overalls and potentials here with our draft class. So again, taking a look at what we have here on our list, we've got Brady Urker. He's an outfielder. And I'm only looking at the primary position. I'm not looking at the secondary position here. So for our channel supporters, Brady Urker is the only player that would be up for vote there. We've got GB Wallace as a center fielder. That's it for channel points. And then through Fantasy Challenge, we have one outfielder, Zach Zumwalt. He's a right fielder, outfielder. Um, can play all, all positions in the outfield there. So Zach Zumwalt a 70A. 70A, 70B for GB Wallace, and 70B for Brady Urker. So at this point, it just depends on between those three outfielders who you want to replace Ryan Smith with. Just depends on kind of what you think that Pittsburgh needs. Do they need a contact fielding guy like Brady Urker? Do they need a GB Wallace, who is a power fielding type of player? Or do they want to go with Zach Zumwalt, who's power speed? So it just really depends on what you think as a community, what you think that they need, right? So I, I like the setup here. I think it's pretty cool to get you guys all involved into the series like this. But then as we see, we're going to move a lot faster because you can't pause the draft. But like for Michigan, they're on the clock. They're going to take this dude here, Franklin McCormick. So he's a starting pitcher. He's 100% scouted. But again, that stuff does not matter. Um, and then we're going to be flying through the draft at this point. So really what I'm looking at here is we have to replace Franklin McCormack with a starting pitcher prospect that's been submitted by the community. Then we scroll down and we see that Oklahoma City drafted a center fielder. Colorado drafted a shortstop. So on and so forth. Raymond Song's a pitcher. So we really got to fill all of these guys, these CPU drafted guys, with our own custom players. Right? So that's how that's going to work. Now, if, if one of these teams, they, they take a guy and we don't have a, a custom player at that position, then, you know, they kind of... I mean, that, that's the, the luck of the draw, right? So if we don't have any more pitchers available to draft, then, you know, Kansas, Kansas City is going to be stuck with Mar Marcellus Cruz <laughs> if we don't have any more pitchers that are available, you know? Or uh, Juan Valdez, if we don't have any more first basemen available, then Minnesota is going to be stuck with whatever Juan Valdez is rated. But I think it might make the most sense because we only have 28 players to be drafted i think to kind of speed it along we could just like simulate to the next sting pick and uh then we can kind of determine from there because we have three minutes basically four minutes to determine like here's where you know we can kind of cross off what players are are available next right and see if we need to even continue on with the draft at that point. Because if we don't, then we can just go ahead and simulate to the rest of the draft. And then from here, then we can kind of slow it down a little bit, right? We can have some more discussions, we can have some more votes, then we're not like pressed for time, right? So the list stays static. It's not moving anymore, right? So we can see like, what each team drafted. Let's see what the Richmond Good Boys did. We we drafted Bernardo Murillo. Starting pitcher. Probably we got a good run of pitchers here. So I, I think that uh, that's not going to be a custom slot. It's not going to be a custom player slot. And that's okay. That's okay. But after that, after that, after we get done with our draft, then we'll just go ahead and exit that up and um, 
get over here to All-Star festivities. We got Home Run Derby, we got the All-Star game. And then from there we'll uh we'll get to trade day. We'll do some more simulation. We'll get to trade day. Start coming up with some deadline scenarios and uh some trading scenarios that I'll have to come up with the majority of them, but you know, I'm always open to see what the community wants to do. It'll be a fun live stream here on Friday night. And uh, just really just looking at like teams that are looking to sell. Teams that are looking to buy and teams that are looking to sell. You know, does Colorado, I know we have a lot of Colorado fans out there. They're only 10 games back. <laughs> I say only 10 games, but they're three and a half out of the wild card. You know, are they going to be buyers or are they going to be sellers? You know, by the time that July is almost finished up, are they going to be in the mix or are they not? We'll have to find that out. So, guys, that is it for today's video. Leave a like if you like this thing. I'll see you in the next one here Friday night, live stream for the draft and all-star game festivities and trade day discussions. So you and I can talk about scenarios and teams that would be looking to buy or looking to sell. So guys, that's it. Again, leave a like if you like this thing. I'll see you in the next one. As always, thank you so much for watching and peace.